Namibia. In the far south of Africa lies a country bordered on the west by the Atlantic Ocean. With a population of less than 3 million, the Republic of Namibia gained its independence in March 1990. Many still consider Namibia a young nation. A lot of development has taken place across the country in various sectors. Apart from all the developments and successes that the country has achieved in the last 30 years, there are still looming setbacks that need to be addressed if Namibia is to achieve its long-term goals set in Vision 2030. These challenges include high level of unemployment, mainly amongst youth, income inequality, high level of corruption and gender-based violence. In terms of infrastructure development, more roads still need to be constructed, improve health facilities with an upgrade to all state hospitals across the country and the need to improve affordable housing. Despite these challenges, there is still a lot to embrace in this young nation. For development to occur, it is imperative to have proper roads and railway networks on the African continent with the best road infrastructure that enables Namibia to link most of the landlocked neighbouring countries with an outlet to the sea. The railway network stretches over 2,687 kilometres across the country, from the South African border in the south to the northern part of our country and from the midline of the country to its coast and harbour towns. The roads follow a similar pattern and as for the dual roads stretching from the Namibian coastal towns of Wolfish Bay and Swakopmund with the potential to reach Botswana is some of the new infrastructure aimed to improve the road network in the country. The road has been constructed to keep heavy loading truck off the main Wolfish Bay Swakopmund road which will create a smooth traffic free flow on the tourist coastal road. Air transport is one other sector Namibia can take pride in, with 8 airports and 27 airfields with paved runways. The Andimba Toivoya Toivo Airport, formerly known as Ondangwa Airport, is one of the newly renovated airports. This airport is about 5 kilometers outside Ondangwa. In 2015, the airport received a facelift which gave it a handling capacity of about 2,477 aircraft movements and 41,429 passengers. On the international map, Namibia is the gateway to the Southern Africa Corridor, making Wolfish Bay one of the main harbour towns for SADC landlocked countries. Uh, we've got a facility now that has the capacity to be able to accommodate most of the containers that are coming out of uh, landlocked countries. Uh, the second benefit is that with a facility like this, you are able to uh, put in uh, state-of-the-art equipment, technologies and all that uh, to make sure that your clients worldwide receives world-class service. We've got a lot of countries that are bringing in containers here, uh, especially mainly our biggest customer is Zambia, uh, followed by the DRC. We have seen a few containers now also coming out of uh, the likes of Botswana and Zimbabwe. Since 1994, the Namibia Ports Authority Namport has been providing world-class port services to all seaborne trade with excellent customer service, creating sustainable growth dedicated to the transformation of Namibia into a global logistics hub. Beyond the, the container terminal itself, uh, this places Namibia economically uh, to on par with countries like South Africa. We know they are bigger than us, but if you look at this facility, a world-class facility like this, uh, brings those economic benefits that our country needs. Five to ten years from now, we've got roads that are being built all around uh, Walfish Bay and Namibia for that matter, connecting us uh, via the various corridors, which is the Trans-Kalahari Corridor, the um, Walfish Bay, Dolalum Bashi Corridor. So within the next five to ten years, we would want to see uh, Walfish Bay as a logistics hub, uh, more closer to the likes of Dubai, 
Singapore and all those other parts of the world. Not so far from the port along the coastal shore lies an oil storage facility which was implemented by NAMPOD and is 100% owned by government through NAMCO. The project has two facilities, the offshore and the onshore facility. The offshore facility is operated by NAMPOD while the onshore facility, the fuel facility tanks, are operated by NAMCO. The onshore consists of office buildings and marine vessels, monitoring instruments, while the offshore tank farm consists of product storage tanks, firefighting facilities, nitrogen generation facility, vapor recovery facility, office building, roads and rail for loading and offloading, and a private terminal supply connection for ULP and HFOs. This facility has tankers with the capacity to handle 60,000 dead weight of oil processing and a storage space of 75,000 cubic meters. When it comes to the mining sector, the country is rich with mineral resources. Uranium and gold are some of the natural resources found in Namibia. One of the mining companies operating in Namibia is B2 Gold, situated between Otavi and Ochivorongo in the Ochisonjupa region. So our first full year of production was in 2015. And since then we've produced above budget, more ounces of gold than targeted at below cost, cost per ounce, cost per ton, every single year since we began the operations. It's 15, 16, 17, 18, and now 19, fifth year of our production. So we're very proud of what we've achieved. And throughout the period of our production, we have managed to add tremendous value to the communities in which we operate, um, to the environment, to health, education, and one of our most recent additions has been arts and culture, which we're, we're supporting through our CSI programs, Corporate Social Investment. We um, are very focused on training and development, and we're, we're very focused on adding skills to Namibians, especially previously disadvantaged Namibians. Um, so we give out a, a number of full-term scholarships um, each year in various fields. You know, obviously the engineering fields are probably the most popular because uh, we are a company that's based on engineering, metallurgy, geology, uh, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering and that sort of thing. But we're also looking at um, skills upgrading and, and promoting the development of our staff in all sorts of fields, whether it's medical or finance, um, accounting and that sort of thing. So it depends very much on the need and it depends on um, our PDPs, personal development plans for our individuals. Holding the second largest uranium mine in the world and the largest open pit mine on the African continent, Swakop Uranium is situated in the Namab Desert. The Swakop Uranium mine, locally known as Husap Mine, contributes greatly to Namibia's economy. The mine has the potential to produce 15 million pounds of uranium oxide per annum. It contains approximately 280 million tons of uranium ore and mining is expected to last nearly 20 years. The country has been attracting a lot of investors in the energy sector and this has potential for vast economic benefits as the energy industry in Namibia is being explored to the maximum considering the fact that Namibia is the driest country in sub-Saharan Africa there is no better way to take advantage of the Namibian scotching heat than using the sun as a source of energy. With 449 tables and 40 PV panels per table Trekopje Solar Farm in Orano Mine is a solar energy producing hub on the outskirts of Arandas. Uh, it's, it's simple, like you, you, we don't have to take out money from our economy to go buy electricity elsewhere while we have the sun. We all know Namibia is a, is a desert area, we have a lot of sun all over. Why don't we use that to our advantage? And we all know uh, green energy is the future, so um, I think it's time that we actually start building solar farms all over the country. Another such development amongst many others is the Tsumkwe Solar Farm which supplies electricity to the community of Tsumkwe. This project has benefited the Tsumkwe community in a very very great way. Uh, I would say first of all we are having 24-hour electricity. Uh, the businesses have 
multiplied two times over. We are having a fruits and vegetable shop. Uh, we are having a butchery now because of the supply of electricity. The hospital is having 24-hour electricity. Before that, uh, if somebody wants to give birth in the night, they, could, they, they were using candles and torches. Like now, since we have solar installations, really we have a lot of problems which have been solved. The clinic is 24-7. They, there's a lot of uh, the freezers are working. The medicines are now cool. There's no more expiring before if they come expiring dates. But before, but like now, really we have even the loss of deaths are not so high like before. I want to see a lot of solar farms, not only in Arandes, also in the south. Not only PV panels. I also want to see wind energy. Um, um, Yes, uh, it will in a way help with uh, job creations. We know we have a problem with jobs currently in the country. So uh, if they can build solar farms all over, in the north, everywhere. Another private school for Mochivarongo, uh, Edugate, have linked up with our Chumque Secondary School and they are having uh, what we call uh, these Skype kind of classes. When they are teaching in Ochivarongo, Actually, kids in Chumque are also being taught by the same teacher in Ochevarongo. Namibia also has a booming fisheries sector which consists of both marine-based fisheries and aquaculture. There is no denying that the country's economy heavily relies on the fishing industry and it's for this reason the government set up fish farms in various regions countrywide. One such farm is the Leonardville Fish Farm in Omaheke region, which is fed with fingerlings from the Hartap Fish Farm. Here it's strictly aquaculture. Aquaculture a branch of fisheries and aquatic sciences that deals with the farming of uh, or with aquatic organisms under a controlled environment. As you can see right here behind me. Um, we culture fish and it's uh, tilapia Mozambicus. The scientific name is Oricromis Mozambicus. So we, uh, what we actually do here is we are a grow-out facility. We receive uh, fingerling fish from our colleagues in Mariental and then we grow them into market-sized fish and we sell them. The Leonardo Fish Farm supplies fish to the inhabitants of Omaheke region. This project is a, a community project for the Leonardo community so the beneficiaries to the project is the Leonardville uh, community uh, but we also cater across the Oma, in the Omaheke region and the surrounding areas. Yeah. The Hardap Inland Aquaculture Center is one of the high volume fish farms in the country which was constructed at the cost of 35 million Namibian dollars. It is located on the outskirts of Marintal at the Hardap Dam. Hardap Dam, which is under the supervision of the Namibia Wildlife Resort NWR, has been the biggest dam in the country over the years since independence till the construction of the Nekartal Dam. The dam flows year in and year out without drying out, with water levels on the rise due to recent amazing rains. The Hardap Dam is the main water supplier to the irrigation schemes in the surrounding area. When the dam is full, um, the, the green scheme flourishes. And when the green scheme flourishes, then obviously we get veggies, um, um, we get um, fruit. Um, everybody does benefit and people have money. And when people have money, business does very well. The Nekartal Dam is a curved gravity dam on the Fish River in the southern part of Namibia. The dam's purpose is to support a 5,000 hectares irrigation scheme nearby. It has a gross storage capacity of 857 million cubic meters. The agricultural sector is bearing fruit countrywide with AgriBus Dev managing irrigation farms all across the country and various grape farms in the far south. One such irrigation farm is the Shadi Kongoro Green Scheme in Kavango East. The farm covers about 700 hectares of land and produces mainly maize, which is the biggest supplies of maize in the country. It's about, the size is uh, 700 hectares, where we irrigate uh, 300 hectare commercial and uh, 
90 hectare for the small scale farmer that is a part of the project. And we also plant the 200 hectares of dry land, mainly sunflower and millet. And yeah, it's the project is actually one of the good projects. The project has benefited Namibians since its establishment in 1974. It has about 35 permanent workers and spends about 2 million Namibian dollars a year on casual workers. Uh, Shari is helping them with cultivating the fields, irrigating, uh, providing the water that they can irrigate the fields, help them to control the pests. At the end of the day, when it's harvesting time, the farmer can earn a good flowing from, from this small plot that he earned. I'm Nakale Elasmus from Angwena Legion. I started here since 2000. I was started with uh, six hectare, I mean three hectare. Now as I'm talking, I have nine hectare. Yeah, I'm from the street. Now I have uh, a kid, more than 16. Then now as I'm talking, they are at the university because of green skin. Oh, the, the aim of the, uh, the government come up with the way to have a prot. If you could do not, maybe I'm supposed to, to stay in the window. Within walking distance from the Orange River along the Namibia South Africa border is the Namibia Grape Company. The Namibia Grape Company is a prime table grape harvesting company established in 1998, which produces 1.7 million boxes of grapes for export and local use yearly. Um, what I've noticed over the years I've been here is that grapes, grapes are in demand globally. Yeah, unfortunately in Namibia where the population is low, so the demand is low. But on a world scale, grapes are, 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 are highly in demand. On this specific farm here, we have we have 18 different varieties cultivars. Basically, the 18. They, um, they're categorized between white, black, and red. Yeah, some, uh, some of the grapes aren't even sold here in Namibia. They're actually just exported. The major key factor is employment creation for up to 270 permanent employees. Through its operations, it affords seasonal jobs to up to 1,530 Namibian citizens. I'm always trying to encourage the youth, yeah, to, first of all, to go into agriculture. Agriculture is, is, is really a, a sector that is un, um, overlooked. People don't really know the benefits, they don't know what it has to offer. Sanitation also improved over the years. The proportion of households with no access to toilets declined from 57% in 1993 and 1994 to 45% by 2015 and 2016, according to the latest National Income and Expenditure Survey. This is the vacuum sewerage system that was proposed and installed for Hibion based on the topographical setup of, 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 the, of the area and because of the hard rock. Uh, it was supposed to be a cheaper system because it's a system running shallow, but uh, the system due to inexperiences of the, on the side of the community as well as on the side of, of, of the technical staff which was not properly, either not properly trained uh, on how to operate the system. The system completely collapsed, uh, which resulted in the system to be replaced on a very high cost. About 30% of the system have been replaced with the gravity system, which uh, already costed government in the tune of 34 million. This is now the, the pump station uh, with a sump, where you collect now all the water that gravitates from the highest point uh, down here to, to this sump. Now the sump from here uh, pumps the water to the sewerage ponds. Water supply in Namibia for both rural and urban areas come from various sources like boreholes, dams, lakes and Oshana pans. This includes ephemeral surface water, groundwater, unconventional water sources and perennial surface water. 
Water supply have been the outcry of many Namibians living in rural settings since independence and the local government has promised to deliver on their request by means of water pumps and community dams. The Ministry of Agriculture, Water and Forestry indeed worked towards achieving that goal by constructing multiple reservoirs in the country. One such reservoir is the Umtele Community Dam which supply water to the community of Umtele Village. So we have a pro government project which has been started in uh, 2016 uh, with an aim of supplying water into these communities. So Umtele community has been suffering for so long particularly those who are going to be beneficiary of this line. Uh, this, this line is, is connected from Calwek stream. When you talk about Calwek, this water is coming from Angola, in a dam which constructed those years. Water is a very costly exercise or project. It's a very costly to maintain even. So we must start appreciating the government effort and must acknowledge the achievement we, 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 are, we achieved as government and also to make sure that we maintain this infrastructure for the generations to come. Namibia is amongst the prime tourist destinations in Africa, boasting a large number of wildlife species found nowhere else in the world. Nearly 20% of employment in the country is directly or indirectly related to the tourism industry. The sector contributes to about 14.5% of the country's GDP and more than 1 million tourists flock the country's national parks and other tourist destinations each year. As a renowned ecotourism destination, Namibia's economy is heavily reliant on its extensive wildlife. I'm very passionate about the fact that when travellers come to Namibia, they not only witness the beautiful wildlife destinations, the traditions and when they do come to Namibia, they are more conscious travellers these days that come and give back to the communities in Namibia, which once again transfers back to arts and culture and being custodians of the wonderful traditions, diverse cultures that we have in Namibia. So for me, tourism is most definitely the key, not only to our economic growth, but definitely for the potential to promote Namibia internationally. So the 1990s, the catch word in education was education for all. The Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture is one of the ministries with the largest employment capacity in the country. With more than 30,819 teachers and more than 1,897 schools, the government has vowed to educate every Namibian citizen, young or old. The year 1990 was just a year of planning. I didn't touch anything about changing education. But in December, at the end of that year, I issued my first policy statement. The intentions, where we are going to go. Then I said, we are going to start reforming the education system from grade one to grade 10, or somewhere there. Now, of course, we have adopted English as, as an official language and uh, also as a main language of instruction. The challenges were very obvious. We had to define the language policy. How are we going to balance the various languages within the education system? The Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture, in particular formal education, is responsible for 781,389 learners in total currently. These are accommodated in 1,897 schools, of which only one is this vision school. We have in total a teaching force of 30,894 teachers, of which more than 20,000 are female teachers. And beside these um, government schools, we have 154 private schools. The Rikonga Vision School, which opened its doors to learners in 2013, is the first of its kind in Namibia. 
Regarded as the torch bearer of excellence, the school is a project of the Ministry of Education for gifted and brilliant pupils from previously disadvantaged backgrounds, especially those in rural areas who have shown great potential to develop and succeed in life. So in the same time as the national standards and performance indicators were formulated, the Ministry in its endeavour to provide equitable access to quality, inclusive education for all, across all sectors of society. This concept of vision school was internalized and, I mean, uh, formulated and adopted. It actually was based on this comprehensive school of excellence, whereby the principle of pro-poor access was followed. That means that we would go out into communities to find those orphans and vulnerable children who are specially academically gifted but have not the means to access centers of excellence. It was not so long ago that the ministry introduced free education in all government schools across the country. This, amongst others, is aimed at ensuring universal access to education as the government wants to ensure that every child receives an education. Tertiary education in Namibia is also sought after with multiple campuses across the country. Uh, and I think the benefits that we have achieved by establishing UNAM and NAST and several others is the caliber of the human resources that the country have now. People who are able to make uh, uh, um, advice to government uh, based on evidence, not just uh, emotional decisions, but based on evidence that is reliable and valid that uh, we have seen. Many of the people that are now manning many institutions, whether they are MDs or CEOs, I can mention several of them, are graduates of uh, UNAM, for example. So it's very, very important to have institutions because it speaks to the development of human resources in the different sectors. But one major component that is very, very important, which I feel needs still to be strengthened, is research. Research and development. Uh, without research, a country cannot develop because you would not know what you don't know. The University of Namibia has 12 campuses countrywide, one of which is the Jose Eduardo dos Santos campus in Onguadiva. The Jose Eduardo dos Santos campus offers engineering courses. The first intake was done in 2009 with 42 students and the number has since increased to 260 students. 33% of the student population comes from the SADC region and the remaining 67% are Namibians, representing all 14 regions in the country. For Oshakati campus itself, I would like to say that uh, it has uh, done a great, it's one of our mother campuses now, you call it, it's a mother campus, it's the people campuses. And uh, when you look at it, we started gradually with one program, which is health sciences, that is nursing. It's the oldest uh, program at the university. And uh, for sure, gradually later, the staff which was mobilized to come and look after this program have seen also the need to facilitate uh, entry into higher education for the young children from rural areas with poor background of English, poor great background of sciences, not because of their own uh, mistakes, but because of the environment where they are coming from. And uh, through that, we have uh, the campus have facilitated the establishment of a science foundation program and English access program. In the line of industry building and manufacturing, Namibia has vocational training centers, VTCs, and community skills development centers, COSTEC, countrywide. We have roughly seven public VTCs in the country. We have the Hobbes VDC that we have just established and officially taken over by NTA on, on I think, 16 June 2017 from Costex that was actually spearheading or running them. Then we have the Enana VDCs that you all know, Nagayale. We have the Valambola VDC. Then we have Rondo VDC. Then we have Sambese VDC. 
we have the Aguacarara VDC. We have NIMT also as part of the TVET sector. Then we have the Window Progression and Training Center. Then as per our agenda, transformation and expansion strategy, there will be a lot of VDCs around the regions. Yeah? All 14 regions should have a footprint of TVET centers or colleges in the country. So we teach them in different uh, programs that we offer, like Microsoft Word, Excel, Publisher, PowerPoint, yeah, and more on finance, basic finance. After level two, when you are done uh, writing your assessment, you go for your job attachment in the industry, you come back to complete your level three. They attend a six month uh, internship in the industry. Uh, I went to Fras Dimbare in 2015 to do a course for uh, January and cabinet making, that is Capping Tree. So I took that course for a one year period. At first I didn't know the direction where to. I was in the street where there's a lot of bad things, crime, all those things, but I went out. So don't waste time, don't hesitate. Go to Frasnambari right now and try to acquire the skill which is there. Unlike VTC, COSTEC has no grade 10 or grade 12 requirements as they intend to upskill those who fail grade 10 or grade 12. We cater for the youth, the, the, the drops out. The difference between COSTEC and the, uh, the VTC is the, the, the entry requirement. At COSTEC we look at the, the youth that could not make it to, to, to the VTCs because we, we train them, we, we don't have the grade 10 and the grade 12 requirement. We may have in other trades, but in the technical trades, we just take the, the youth that will not make it to grade 10 and grade 12. Information and communication technology does not contribute to the Namibian economy in the same way that perhaps the fishing or mining sectors do. However, indirectly, the ICT sector contributes a great deal through knowledge and skills development. It has been proven that the ICT sector in Namibia has been instrumental to the creation of sustainable growth and development to the nation in the last 30 years. The Namibian government is adamant about combating and alleviating unemployment and poverty, especially amongst the youth. For this reason, the government through the Ministry of Trade and Industry implemented a project to fund small and medium enterprises in order to combat unemployment in the fight to eradicate poverty. Southern Gemstone and Jewelry, Oshana Ceramic Project and Ohorongo Cement are some of the many companies in the manufacturing industry creating jobs in the country. The Oshana Ceramic Project was established in 2013 under the One Region One Initiative Program executed by the Ministry of Urban and Rural Development. The initiative has been implemented to create job opportunities among rural communities. <laughs> Kucho Maroya, Orusheno, Omea, Kucha Pifa Tutura Kurusheno Tene, Tatu Futu Tene, Omea Reto. Kamuino Ondo Vitenawa, No Hando Vunawa Ngeng and Daiki Topo, I mean Kaka Repoporo Ekaeto, and to enjoy her pen, her to revenge him on Dungan Mare, so Otash Pendura Po, a Hunjuka Queto, O Potu Roku and Burapo, a stop Russia to Mokuyo. No, she rongo se tu mona mi pie. Anto enzo ta kama munda uya hama china no se tu mara son tu toi wi. Wow, ini mambi no irongo mona mi pie. Serious, ma tu vura ukana ndako shopreita nenge kopi ken pen nenge pen pen. Diamond cutting and polishing are some of the specialties of Southern Gemstone jewelry. Um, what we do here is we produce jewelry um, with Namibian gemstones which we source from local miners, mostly from the southern region, but also throughout the, uh, Namibia. It uh, creates opportunities for miners to sell the, the stones. Uh, 
there's the tax advantages for the country, which means there's no uh, less rough material going out of the country because value addition is done locally, uh, more specifically cutting and polishing. The company has three permanent employees and provides part-time employment to locals as well. Moreover, they provide training and internships to students who specialize in gemology. The course is mostly based on gemology to learn about the Namibian gemstone. Not only on Namibian gemstone, we have quite a lot compared to our neighboring country in Sadek and all over Africa. The other part of the course is about uh, metal smithing, the art of metal smithing, which we have been running for really a long time ago, which is now jewelry manufacturing to be able to produce a piece like for example here at the gemstone center it's really good you can buy a stone here cut it here and they can build something into material which we can put on the table for export and to say okay it's a fully 100 percent namibian product or if we have to take it out of africa it's really made in africa i'm currently on a, a gemology uh, training a nine months training uh, which has to do with a handmade jewelry. Uh, it's always that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but didn't have any ways how to start, no ideas or how to start, where to go and for help. So uh, from here, uh, with the knowledge and skills that I get here, I will have to go and start my own business doing the jewelry in Namibia. The Ohorongo Cement Manufacturing Company owns one of the most modern cement plants in Africa. It was constructed over the course of two years by leading international engineers policiers with local companies involved in the provision of infrastructure and civil works. All raw materials required for the production process are sourced in Namibia and the entire value chain takes place within the country. This makes Ohorongo Cement a 100% proudly Namibian product. A healthy nation is a productive nation. 30 years after Namibia gained its independence, a number of health facilities have been established to aid and improve the health of people. We have been challenges, I mean challenged by some of the diseases like malaria. But then, since independence, there was the primary health care introduced. And uh, to that effect, a large number of clinics were brought up in the district of our Onanjoku. And because of those uh, clinics, the primary healthcare activities has been running smoothly. Some of the patients or clients before independence has been uh, <coughs> finding it tough to get to bigger hospitals. But uh, after independence, they have a possibility of just going to the nearest clinic. And then if they have a need to get to a bigger hospital, the clinic just uh, give a call or call the hospital and then the ambulance go there to bring the patient to the hospital. The achievements of uh, this hospital is that uh, we recently uh, created a, 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 a neonatal intensive care unit which is by, uh, five bedded which is and government supported us with ventilators so uh, this is something that is new could not ventilate even two babies here, but now we can ventilate even up to, to six babies. So we get now babies from Omthia, from Tsume. Like before I came here, a doctor from Tsume was calling to referring a, a baby. So we are saving like lots of babies because of, of, of that improvement. And one of our really big achievements is that we've managed to reduce our uh, neonatal mortality to almost like 10 per 1,000 life beds. And I think if you know the sustainable, sustainable development goal uh, uh, aim is that by 2030, we should have like at least less than 10. Uh, you know, single digit figures of uh, neonatal death. So I think we are almost there. Even. Provision of decent shelter is at the center of government's priorities as presented in NDP5. The housing sector is often described as a major contributor to the national economy. Besides the financial impact on the economy, housing also impacts the social, political, and environmental fabric of society. 
Sustained and increased housing development output therefore presents great potential for various spin-offs with positive impacts on various socio-economic indicators. In 2013, the government initiated the Mass Urban Land Servicing Project with the aim of servicing residential plots for low- and lower-middle-income earners in urban areas. A total of 37,309 urban were serviced between 2012 and 13 and 2018 and 19. Cabinet also adopted the Mass Housing Development Program in 2013 and since then, the Build Together Program has been integrated into the Mass Housing Development Program, providing more serviced land around the country. The program aimed to deliver 185,000 housing units by 2030. This housing program, however, faced some challenges that resulted in the government discontinuing the program in 2015. I started working in 2005. I try to get a house through energy, but I cannot get a house. Because that time my salary was too little, and I can ask for a subsidy, but I cannot get a house. But lucky enough, when I came here, I was working at Kahenge, and the, this way I started getting this house. And the, you know, in our culture, if a man doesn't have a house, I can tell you that the, no one will recognize you that our culture is say a man must have a house. The, the house has changed my life since I started having this house, even though it's too, too small for the whole family, but it, it really it makes sense for me to have a house. Sport is an overlooked sector in Namibia. Legendary athlete Frankie Fredericks breaks down how Namibian athletes have benefited from the government over the years. Um, the highlights obviously was um, the first World Championships medal. I think um, the team that competed at the All African Games that brought back four gold medals, um, you know, two, two silvers and six bronze. I think that for me was a, was a big achievement. I think obviously um, the Olympic Games winning two, two, two medals there, the Commonwealth Games. For me, that, that is probably the highlights when it comes to individual medals. I think if we come to teams, obviously the rugby qualifying six times for the World, Rugby World Cup. I think the, 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 the Brave Warriors qualifying for the, for the AFCON. I think if you think of uh, individuals like Harry Simon competing, Hilalia Arvanes, Lucas Swarboy, you know, all these athletes that have done so much. I think for me, in terms of sporting, that is probably the highlights. I think it's a big achievement and that's why we realise now after, after 30 years of independence that we've only won our first Olympic, gold medal, or first Olympic medals in 92 and 96. So that was the last time we've achieved. So we have to ask ourselves what did we do well during those years and what did we not do well? That we do not have any medals after that. I think the Commonwealth we are, are doing well, we are achieving medals, but at the Olympic level we only have the four that I've won. Um, so I think that is obviously um, a thing that we as a nation need to look at and how to achieve. Another question we can ask ourselves is, okay, we've qualified for the World Cup in rugby. We have not won a match. What do we need to do to now secure that the young men and the young boys are winning a match so that we take ourselves to the next level to make sure that we are not just participating but we are competing as a nation. It was not an easy journey bringing these developments into existence. The government did face challenges in the establishment of the National Planning Commission, who are the custodians of planning and development in the country. Uh, what actually has changed is the fact that uh, when we started, there was no planning commission. So much of our time was devoted to creating a National Planning Commission. But that is one difference that has to be taken into account. The other thing when we talk about uh, changed conditions is that um, at the time of independence, you know when you plan, there is a, a common saying among planners that you cut your coat according to the cloth. In other words, you plan on the basis of the resources available etc. Now uh, at independence we were confronted with different conditions which led us for example to rely heavily on foreign aid. 
so it was a, an entirely different environment. Uh, first of all, we spent a lot of time creating the institution uh, and we had to do it by first of all uh, acknowledging that there were certain things that we didn't have. We knew what we didn't know and what we didn't have. What gives me the greatest satisfaction in how we transfer, transformed from where we were by way of developmental activities to where we are. From the provision of port facilities, road infrastructure, airport facilities, telecommunication infrastructure to enable uh, connectivity and the movement of goods and services. These are very significant. That gives me greater satisfaction. Of course, at the same time, we can't just look at satisfaction. What are the chronic or the stubborn uh, parts of service provision we need to look at? And I think that should come in a review of the next National Development Plan or the entire Vision 2030 going forward so we can sharpen that part of service delivery in attaining the goals, prosperity, inclusivity and service to people. Namibians have a lot to be grateful for and its 30th celebration of independence is yet another milestone for this great nation. The way I interpret or perceive education, I mean, uh, independence is not the way those who were born after independence are interpreting independence. So to me, and the people of my age feel happy because now we are governing ourselves. Because now we have our own flag and we call ourselves independent. But for the young ones, they want to know whether this independence will make me to be dependent financially, will make me to be able to have, to start my family, will there be employment for me, will they create, this independence create um, innovation so that at least new avenues are created for me, my family and my friends. So, independence is crucial for all of us. I want to give this message to the people of this land. We must never take what we have done for granted. We must safeguard the gains of our independence. <laughs> Most things that I have well in my country, in the independent countries, I got education, hospitals, shops, stuff. I can the, the white the white bread that I was not buying now today I can buy it. In the past we were buying only brown bread for black people, but today we can buy also a white bread that we have never had before. The income of the Kaya command is for me also like a gebruik. So I can hide my kind to school in for myself can look down like a man. So in the early days, not so much income to have. In the old days, we buy a few things, but now we are long away from that. So much to that to carry. I feel and I think as we all must be self to come, to come work in. All must be self to be able to give work. That none of the foreigners in the foreigners all must in 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 ban must live or in live must live work. 
Namibia is not only admired by its citizens but the world over. Its complex scenery with artistic natural beauty is one of many attractions. Borders that was costing taxpayers money, a lot of money. There was instability in the country. So the biggest milestone that this country has achieved in the last 30 years that we have to pat ourselves on the back is the fact that we have become a country of peace with ourselves. Our development is anchored on peace and stability. And that is something that Bolivia can pat itself on the back. Of course, with the 30 years, uh, one can also pat ourselves on the back. But this country, prior to independence, did not have rights. And now today we have human rights, we have liberties. Let us, as Namibians, be united and work together for the common good of all Namibians, irrespective of color or race or places of origin. Because I believe that the people who are united, striving to achieve a common good for all the members of the society, will always emerge victorious. We should endeavor, we should endeavor to embrace and uphold the culture of hard work and to act in the best interest of our country at all time. The future of our country will be defined by our individual and the collective actions. Today and tomorrow. I therefore urge my fellow Namibians to hold hands in the name of unity, peace, and security. Let us stand firm, stand strong, stand proud against those who seek to weaken us. We have prevailed through various internal crises and we will prevail again. Let us get into the mentality of a one Namibia. This is our country, whether you are from whatever region, whether you are from whatever background, it's very important for us to stand together as a nation because only when we stand together, we will achieve a lot. I just want to say congratulations, obviously 30 years um, uh, being independent, uh, what an achievement to, um, to be where we are right now, you know, to live in a peaceful country um, and I mean, there's so much more to come from Namibia. Uh, let's dream big, let's go places and, and, and show the world what we've got as Namibian. Um, I'm extremely proud to be Namibian, uh, as I'm sure all Namibians are, you know, and um, I mean, we can only strive to be, to be a great country, an even greater country than we already is. We have to enjoy ourselves and it's the 30th birthday and I'm also turning 30th this year and it's amazing to celebrate together as a Namibian. Happy birthday Namibia! I am personally so proud of all the successes that Namibia has achieved over the last 30 years. So here's to a prosperous, successful and blessed Namibia for the future. My Namibia, my country, my pride.